My name is Jasmine Montilla. I am a professional buyer with UC San Diego, and I'm also a compliance specialist. Uh, my counter co-presenter is Joshua Black. Here he is. Um, we are going to be training PO requisitioners, financial unit approvers, fund managers, and inquiring staff about how to navigate Oracle and all of the fun parts <laughs> that we have with it. Hey, Jasmine, sorry to cut you off. I'll put in the live transcripts. Awesome sauce, right? Let's have that increased inclusivity there. Thanks, JB. Um, next slide for us is some quick tips and tricks before we get into it. So welcome campers, thank you for attending. Um, we're starting off, our moderator is Sylvia. She's going to be making sure that everything is muted so that you have the best experience possible and we can avoid some background noise. Feel free to submit your questions in the chat. Uh, you can either use the general chat or you can send it to Sylvia directly. We'll be keeping a Google document going to address what questions need to get asked in the end and what support that we can give you uh, and resources that are available. Please note a copy of the slides will be shared to all registered attendees after camp so you don't have to furiously take notes. We will be sharing this with you later. Additionally, this session will be recorded. So please turn off your camera if you're not comfortable being part of the recording. Um, it is whatever makes you comfortable, please. And then finally, there is a wrap up session on Friday, which will include some raffles and prizes. Um, and then throughout the week, there's also some additional Camp IPPS courses that you can take. So feel free to register if you haven't already and we can continue getting started. Next up, we're gonna go over our, our objectives. First up, you will have you will be able to accurately complete a requisition in Oracle, Oracle procurement. I say this with the intention of you will be able to complete a simple requisition via Oracle procurement. Uh, you'll leave this course with the understanding on how to complete your requisitions in the purchase order module. So anything from buying a pencil to buying a piece of paper. Those, those are the basics that will definitely get out of the way. But then point two is you'll learn the essentials to navigating Oracle procurement. You'll learn the different areas of the homepage, where you should go for support, what resources are available, and where you may run into issues. Then you'll be able to recognize the challenges that come from getting a request from the requisition stage to the PO stage. And those are our three objectives today. And I think they're good. you are going to leave well-versed in the world of Oracle. Now, some things that you should know. We have a plethora of tools available. IPPS offers a ton of resources ranging from weekly newsletters, walk me, training videos, office hours, services and support, buying and paying for requisitioners, buying 102 in blank for policy information, alongside KBAs for instructions. Important point number two, missing documentation matters. If you enter a requisition without supporting documentation, it will increase the delay time. Point three, purchasing categories are quite important. They determine where your requisition will be routed and how taxability will be driven off of the purchasing categories. And then the final piece to note is that POs and requisition numbers are 11 digits long and they are extremely important to use now because in our legacy system, we used the PO number starting with nine. So if you only provide the suppliers or anyone with IPPS numbers without the PUR or the REQ, it will take some time for us to provide you some support. So those are some good tips to come in with. Really quickly, I'm gonna go through our agenda. It's going to be super brief. Hopefully there will be time for some Q&A, allow some time to provide you with additional resources, and then know what future trainings you would like IPPS to provide based on what we're presenting today. So today we're gonna to go over the purchasing code of ethics, how to order goods and services via Oracle, what the Oracle request forms look like, and then checking out. So making sure you have proper information in all areas to complete the requirements. Next up, I have the fun part of going over the code of ethics. This is extremely important to me because as procurements compliance specialist, my sole purpose intent is to reduce liabilities and adhere to UC policy and procedures alongside everything else that comes. 
So the first thing I'd like to note is that it's the responsibility of using funds granted to UC San Diego in remembering to exercise your fiduciary and ethical responsibilities as a member to the region, to the clients, to students, to citizens, to our California taxpayers. While there are a lot of challenges with submitting a requisition, it stems primarily from ensuring that we're protecting the university and the departments from liability. So practicing transparency and supporting compliance requests will help alleviate roadblocks in issuing POs. So first thing to always look for with the code of ethics is to make sure you're getting the best value for your dollar. Then demand honesty in sales representation. Number three, fair, foster fair ethical and business practices. Number four, give fair and equal consideration to all competitive suppliers. Five, be mindful of UC San Diego's mission and principles of community. Six, decline personal favors and gifts. Seven, conduct business with suppliers ethically. So these are all super important things to remember as you're going through the purchasing process. It is never our intent to hold up a requisition, but we wanna make sure we're doing our due diligence with processing and have fun with it as well. So next up is Joshua Black. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Jasmine. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joshua. I work alongside here with my partner, Jasmine, in the services team as a buyer for procurement. And here today, I will be your guide on navigating through the Oracle UI. <clears throat> so uh, if you look here, this is the home page where you can access virtually anything your task requires. But for now, we are going to focus on that cart symbol right there, which is purchasing requisitions. Can we go to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. All right, so here, uh, if you clicked on that shopping cart symbol, it will take us to this next page here, which is the shopping cart. And as you may know, if you made any online purchases within the last two decades, this is where your orders will appear for you to begin the checkout process. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, recent purchases. This is um, great for individuals who only order a short list of items or orders every couple of months or so. And the thing I like about the recent purchases feature is that it basically saves your information that was previously entered, making the process almost seamless. So it's very click and go. So say as an example, you work in a lab and you need to order cotton swabs every three to six months. So you would go here and a couple of mouse clicks and it's already ready in your cart for purchase. But to note that there are some edits that are still required, such as any attachments or line details should be updated. So next slide, oh, we're already on the next slide catalog. All right, <clears throat> next is the catalog. So usually you would go here to search for any goods or usual purchases by entering any keywords into the catalog search bar. Um, I'll use the same example as before with the cotton swabs. You type in what you need, such as cotton swabs and a whole list of items ranging from different brands or vendors will show up and all will become streamlined. So you will also see on the top left-hand side um, by the shop, cat it's a shop by category, which really narrows down the search results if necessary. And also take note that not every item is located in the catalog, only a selection from our agreement suppliers will be visible. So next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, next is punch outs. So punch outs are a little bit different than the catalog here. I'd say if you're looking for a certain specific supplier or vendor that you know provides whether whatever is a good or service you're looking for, then I would suggest the punch out feature. So for example, you can't find a certain item in the catalog, but you know the vendor supplies it elsewhere. You would be able to go through here and select the agreement supplier like um, Dell or Amazon, and they should have whatever you're looking for. And as a plus, it should come uh, with a special EC pricing 
to get a little cheaper, right? Okay. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> that will be the, at the top right corner, the manage requisitions. So you made all your orders, you're ready to check out, you got your shopping cart, you know, it's larger and larger and your wallet's looking pretty thin. And you know, you got that 80 pack of cotton swabs and 500 rolls of toilet paper for surplus for the lab for the next pandemic. So you're all ready, you're all set to go. And so now you need to know um, that your order's ready to get processed. So you, here is the feature, the manager acquisitions feature. You would uh, essentially, a search engine for all orders placed across UCSD. And here you can do anything from lookup orders from a specific supplier to checking out an existing PO and be able to check on the status of your order as well. So next slide, please. And that basically goes further in depth, piggybacking off that. We have the um, search parameters for the manage requisitions feature. Um, so take a note above, uh, as it reads, you do need at least one field with the blue asterisk entered with the information before you can make a search. As you can see, the supplier item, the entered by the requisition. But essentially, if you want to go in depth and look up a few orders from the supplier Dell, for example, you would type in Dell on the supplier side and REQ rec for the requisition side. And then the search results at the bottom, it should populate nearly every rec we have with them. Showcasing when the order was placed, a uh, description of the order items, the amount and the status of the order, as well as the PO. And um, like I said previously, this can also be used to look up your very own orders if you made one and check the approval status in the meantime. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so yeah. That basically shows um, the blue hyperlink pending approval. Uh, say if you wanted to look up your order, that's the status would say that's, uh, that's pending approval. <clears throat> Go to the next slide, please. So um, here is a chart essentially is the, um, the workflow and how order gets processed from a requisitioner who entered the order downward to the buyer that has to approve the order to produce a PO. And all these different bars going downward are differing approval statuses, if I'm correct, that must be met before we as a buyer can even review the requisition. So the, fl the fully blue uh, encased bars with check marks means that the process has already been completed, whereas the ones without the check marks while still blue is meaning that the process hasn't started yet or some issue occurred along the way. And um, mind you, the buyers can't even review the requisition yet as it's not in our system via the workflow. And that would mean it would probably be currently um, pending from the uh, financial unit approval. So next slide, please. And so now we have a bit of a pop quiz. <clears throat> if you look at the workflow chart here, uh, my question to you guys is where or what is the status of the PO right now? Or what is the status of the requisition? <clears throat> um, if you can read off here. Hi, OK. So is it pending Oracle submission? Is it pending conflict of interest review, pending financial unit approval, or pending buyer approval? And if you can just add your answers to the chat, I'll give you about a couple seconds. Google drum roll. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And answer is pending financial unit approval. Nice, nice. See you guys. All right, cool. <clears throat> All right, next slide, please. Um, so now we have uh, request forms, and I can tell you a little bit about them. There are two types of request forms. One is a mount based and the other is quantity based. My partner Jasmine can go a lot more in depth with you on that. But essentially request forms are best for non-agreement suppliers as they are used for ordering items not in the catalog or punch outs. And all right, from here, I will pass it back to Jasmine so she can go more in depth on request forms. Thank you.
Awesome. Thank you so much, JB. Uh, I hope you guys had fun with that pop quiz. There's another one coming later, so stick with us. I'm going to quickly go over some of our forms, though. This is the most important part. You know, they're all important. This is an important part of the requisition process is determining what form are you going to use. There are two types of forms available. The first one is the bucket of an amount-based form, and the second bucket is a quantity-based form. So in the amount-based forms, we have a couple of options available. We have your first option for reoccurring, reoccurring orders. Those are best for orders where you have multiple shipments or multiple invoices coming through if you're going to do, use a spend down effect on the PO. So you don't know if it's going to be a consistently invoiced amount. You aren't sure how many shipments the supplier is going to need in order to get you all of your goods or services. So this was a great time to use that form. The next is when there is no quantity. So you'll be able to determine if it's that type of field based on the quantity field. If there's no quantity field in your form, you are using an about-based form. So that's an easier way to help you identify them. When in doubt, please use an amount-based form because they're least likely to close unexpectedly. If you use a quantity-based form and you put the quantity of one at let's say $20,000 because you thought it was an amount-based form, your PO will close after the first invoice. So it will save you time in the long run to use an amount-based form. But there are, there are pros to using the quantity-based form. So for example, the first form is the single order form. So that's gonna be a great option to use if you only have one shipment or one invoice. As you know, quantity does matter. So lines shouldn't be grouped together. If you can have a PO that is either based on taxability from the purchasing code, so purchasing category. So if you know like you're doing some event service items and you're using bright event rentals, you can have a taxable line and you can have a non-taxable line. You just wanna make sure you don't group things together. Um, it will cause some issues with invoicing. And then finally, communication is key. Make sure you and the supplier are on the same page. You can always ask them, hey, can you send me a copy or an example of what your invoice looks like? And then you can use that to determine what form to use. So I'm gonna go over these next slides very quickly. These are what the forms look like. You have the goods one-time shipment. It's a quantity-based form. As we've said, it's for one invoice or one shipment. And then two, you have the services with the time-based rate. This is another quantity-based form, but you're gonna use it for when you have some services that are clearly defined in the deliverables where they're only working specific hours, days, months at a time. And you have to make sure your supplier invoices accordingly on those because the PO will close out once the quantity is met. Third is goods with multiple shipments. It's going to be an amount-based form because we don't know how often you would like to invoice against it. And this will ensure that your PO stays open in a timely fashion. Four is services with a fixed price. This is another amount-based form. It's specifically for when you're working with suppliers that are using a period of performance. So consultants not to exceed rate. If you have a statement of work in place, this is the best form for you to use. Fifth is equipment maintenance-based. So it's an amount-based form for service agreements and preventative maintenance is on equipment, uh, inventorial, and that will help you have the back end. So you already bought the inventory, but now you need to have the maintenance in place. So this is a form to use for that. Next is services requiring professional buyer review or signature. It used to be for services or professional services. And we just, we deem that to be a little bit too narrow in view. We wanted to make sure you had all the resources available. So use this form whenever you have a supplier that's giving you some supplier documents and you'd like that reviewed. You do not need to submit a KVA. You can use this form, it will come to us. We'll route it to the direct team and we'll figure out if a contract needs to be considered or if they can just work off of UC terms and conditions. Next up is store purchases for specialty gas and hardware. It's a quantity-based form. So you're ordering one cylinder of nitrogen. <laughs> if you are, there you go. This is the form for you to use. Um, it will be paid via a recharge system, and that's the important piece because it's an internal department um, with the revenue generating services, so anything with store, please use this form. And then here's a new form that came out. 
It's the goods quoted form. It's used for goods that have a quote from the supplier that you can just pop that in and it will be an easier way to get your requisition to the PO faster. Next up, I'm going to show you what it looks like when you go into a form. You have your top highlighted box that says a request type. All of the forms are, they're interchangeable. So you can use the drop down button to select between the different forms and determine which one's the right one for you in this particular request. So your form starts off with the request type, go through each line with an asterisk and please fill that out with an intention of being concise. The item description is going to be specifically used as the note that's sent on the PO to the supplier. So unfortunately, Oracle gives us some caveats in place. We cannot add specialized characters, so anything above the number line. So you, you have to be a little bit more strategic when you're entering information here. Make sure it's concise, but make sure it's description, descriptive at the same time. Buyers do go into this field and they'll update for you as well. So if you ever come back to a requisition and you want to resubmit it, um, feel free to know if we got the item description right before you just automatically submit. It will help us out in the long run. And then on the right-hand side of the form, there's some additional areas uh, for inputting, such as the supplier name. Uh, once you put in the supplier site, uh, either PO Adder 1, or if there's the large groups, you can have a couple there. It will pre-fill the information on the next couple of lines. I do want to highlight one thing. So you see that conflict of interest EVRD checkbox? And then the following EVRD IPPS use only, that is for employee vendor relationship disclosures. So specifically for suppliers with conflicts of interest that you know about, you can use that here. So this means that if you know there's an active UC employee at the company, there is a former employee that created the company, if there's a near relative that the active UC affiliate is working at a UC, you should be disclosing that to us because it's part of the uh, ethics in our code of conduct is to make sure you're working with suppliers that do not have a conflict of interest. And if you are making sure that you sought competition, we want to make sure that the university is practicing their transparency and honesty in our purchasing and noting when we have these type of relationships. So this is not a box to check off. <laughs> Willy nilly, or because you know the supplier, because it will delay your requisition quite heavily. If you click this box and you don't know, I will be reaching out to you. That's my fun job that I have. Then next up is the category name. We pulled this one out specifically because it's quite important. This is what drives your taxability. It drives what team is going to be handling your requisition. Um, and you can always come to our blink page for purchasing categories. We have the quick part up top that shows you the guidance on where to go. Um, and also like, what are some frequently used categories that we see in Oracle? Lower on the page, there is a filter option. So you can type in like, I'm looking for temporary services. It will then filter down what categories that will best fit and get your requisition to the right place for processing. Then next up, is the additional information part of your services request forms. These are quite important. As you'll see, everything has an asterisk. We want you to fill out as much information as possible. Um, this information can come from your supplier. It can come from the statement of work. It can come from the department determining what you need. What fits the department's business needs? How long do you need the supplier? How frequently are you gonna use them? Where is the work performed? Where is the location performed? Um, and if you're ever unsure about this information, reach out to the supplier. They will be more than happy to give you this because they want to work with UC San Diego. And now for the next pop quiz, is everyone ready and paying attention? This is a photo of one of the pending requisitions. Using the same logic as before, A, pending Oracle submission, B, pending conflict of interest review, C, pending financial unit approval, or D, pending buyer approval. Please use a chat to let us know if it's A, B, C, or D, and where this requisition is located. Mm -hmm. I see them coming in. Oh, nice. So 
So A, B, C, or D, has it been submitted yet? Is it pending financial unit approval? Is it pending my conflict of interest review? Or is it pending buyer approval? <laughs> okay, I think that uh, we're stabilizing. So the correct answer is D, it is pending buyer approval. You successfully made it from submitting a requisition to getting your financial unit approvers to sign off to it entering our queue. This means that we're reviewing the requisition, we're cross-checking that we are adding value, that the department has practiced the purchasing code of ethics and there's no missing documentation that will later come back to us during an AMAS audit. We care about audits just as much as you do, so this is quite important to us to make sure that when it's in buyer review, we're doing our due diligence. So we're not just holding it, we're working on it. So next up is the, the, the part, the, the meat of this presentation that we really wanted you to focus on, and that is how to avoid delays in your requisition. First part, the attachment area of your forms. If there is Anything that I can stress to you it is that your attachments matter, what you submit matter. And if you are submitting a form that's over $10,000 and you have federal funds, please add your source selection, price reasonable business justification form. It is important and we will push back if it's not there. Again, if you have federal forms, add in your notice of award. For everything else, please add a quote, an invoice, a statement of work. If you're working with a restricted category code, such as independent contractors and consultants, please add the independent contractors and consultants packet. Additionally, if the supplier provides you with any papers, send those over as well. If you are working with uh, any services on campus, your supplier will need to have a certificate of insurance. So you can add those in here as well. One thing to note though, is when you're using these attachments, avoid using internal to requisition. It does nothing. <laughs> Oracle will not let us remove this from the list, so we have to work with what we have. The best option is to change it to either miscellaneous, which means that it will transfer over to the PO or to supplier, and then that implies that you want the supplier to see that this is what the PO is referencing. So if you have a statement of work created, you are going to use to supplier. So that way the supplier knows that these are the specific deliverables. This is what you are supposed to be doing. This is during the time frame. This is your project manager. And this is the funding source that is in comparison as well. So quite important that you have your attachments in the correct area alongside the correct category. Then next up in avoiding delays, is ensuring that you are cognizant of missing and incorrect details. We quickly went over the line item description and I wanted to highlight this a little bit more. So it really matters what you enter here and I can give you a quick example. If you enter XYZ Consulting, we have no knowledge of what they're doing. Anyone and everyone is a consultant nowadays. That is part of Buzz 43 is we consider any supplier that comes on campus an independent contractor. But in the instances of a purchase requisition, this is a person that is coming to work with the university. They are atypical, infrequent, non-reoccurring. If you are hiring someone to be a project manager for five years, you should think about hiring an employee. So when you're using this item descriptive area, this is what we're really honing in on. If you say certain keywords, it's going to red flag us and we want to ensure we're not adding additional work to your load. So start here in making sure you are being detailed, avoid being too vague or too description. So another example of, instead of saying like XYZ consultant is you can say athletic division one transition project consulting and professional development. It encompasses everything that the department needs alongside what the supplier is doing. Hope that was clear enough. Then next up is avoiding those special characters. <laughs> Oracle's fun, we'll, we'll say this. If you use a special character, there is a chance that your PO will block out the entire item description field. The supplier won't see anything, we won't see anything. So making sure you don't use anything above the numbers key on your keyboard will help make sure that the PO is sent to the supplier accurately. And then 
That final piece that we just noticed, the services form requirements for the additional detail section is quite important. This is how we create contracts and agreements, how we craft our statement of works if we need to revise anything for you. And it helps us in the long run if you enter this information. We don't have it here right now, but we were able to get an enhancement in place that added the supplier project manager right underneath the UCSD project manager. So please know just because there's not an asterisk there doesn't mean that we don't like it. We love it. We love any additional information you can give. Um, <laughs> so before I get too excited about that, I'm gonna go to the next slide. I would like to add this in. This is a long list. So imagine the Star Wars intro. You can avoid delays by making sure you have wondered about if this is a last minute submission, if your purchase is over 100K and there should be a competitive bid. If you have the incorrect payment method selected, it should have been concur or a payment request for catering, bartending, entertainment, quality, subwords, UEO agreements. Um, if the incorrect supplier was selected, we get it. There's a lot of supplier with the same name and you cannot see the DBAs associated if there is any outsourcing of a UC position, so for covered services, if there are animals coming on campus, if you have the incorrect purchasing category code, if there are some HIPAA requirements in place, if the supplier will not agree to UC terms and conditions and we need to negotiate, if you are missing risk management support because you are transporting students off campus, if you're using the incorrect Oracle form for submitting your requisition, and then finally, if you decided that a new requisition was better than a change order, these are all areas that will cause a delay in your processing of the requisition. But I do wanna highlight that we have a lot of these bolded. And that's specifically because there's a lot of these presentations happening with Camp IPPS. We acknowledge that this is a tough area to navigate. And the best way that you can do it is to be informed of the different policies in place and utilize the resources that you have. So I urge you to please sign up for another Camp IPPS course. We have them on competitive bids. What does that look like? We have that on small business. We have that on agreement suppliers, um, covered services, purchasing categories, how to handle the supplier wants a signature, right? We have a whole panel of buyers discussing what you should do and how you should manage that. And then finally, when do you need a change order? So please, I, I urge you to take any of those courses and enjoy. There's a lot of content that is available. So in the last couple of slides, we're gonna go over some quick little caveats. So we went over supplier papers, they're quite important, but we wanna note that sometimes a PO is, will suffice. So is a PO required? You should have a PO if you are purchasing goods or services that should have a contract or purchase order associated. And when we say that, the caveat in mind is, we, the, the department wants UC terms and conditions to be associated with the purchase. So use this rule of thumb when creating a PO. Is there a contract or agreement? Should there be the UC terms and conditions? Is there increased liability for these purchases? And do you require protection of your purchases? So. Do you need a way to hold your supplier accountable? That's the best way to determine if you should have a PO. The best way to actually figure it out without reaching out to IPPS and having to wait or submit a service and support case is to go on Blink and search for the procure to pay decision matrix. It guides university faculty and staff in determining the appropriate payment method for common routine purchases as well as business travel and entertainment expenses. Because sometimes a PO isn't needed, and we understand that and we have alternate options available for you. And then the last slide to review is, is a contract required? So asking yourself this, and as I say this, we understand that certain purchases happen in the PO stage after the services have been rendered. So if you can always be proactive in determining what are the department business needs before purchasing the services, these questions will come in handy. So first off, is the purchase over 100K? Does it hit that threshold? If so, you should be working with the buyer beforehand and going out for bid. Um, and when we say going out for bid, that's either a request for proposal, a request for information, or there's one, um, 
RFQ, I believe, a uh, request for quotes. So you can have the general population give you information on what you're looking for and then determine the best value. So that's why it's, it's point number one in the code of ethics because best value is extremely important. And then next up, is there a risk of life, limb, death, blood, guts, or loss of property? So if the answer is yes, please use a PO. We will also work on getting a contract in place for you. And then finally, does the supplier have access to UCSD systems or data? This is when the HIPAA part comes in alongside something called a BAA. So we'll, we'll navigate this for you, but we just need to know if those pieces are in place. So with that, we have our last slide. This is how you get additional support. You can go onto Blink and type in Oracle Procurement Help. It will bring you to a ton of resources that our CXM, our Client Experience Management team has put together for you. They are repeatedly updating these pages to give you the best options available. Additionally, you can reach out through services and support. We have really good turnaround times, as long as it's routed correctly. We have really good turnaround times. And also we offer office hours three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at varying times. So whenever you want to, you can come in. If you've never submitted a requisition before, that is the place to join. We then go through, um, we'll share screens, we'll teach you what resources are available. We can bounce you between different rooms and teams at IPPS for additional support and we can get you to the right place. So I hope this presentation was informative. Right now we have another 20 minutes. So we can either do some Q&A and then once the Q&A is over, we can let you leave early, give you some time back, but it will all depend on what's coming up. Stop sharing. Hi everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining and staying with me through this long presentation. Um, I'm going to have to figure out how do we want to handle this. Um, Sylvia, were there any questions in the chat that we can address? Yes, actually, we do have a couple questions. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so we can start from the very beginning. Um, so Sandra asked if we can show how to change our search parameters in Oracle to look up an existing PL that doesn't belong to the particular person. Um, so JB, if you wanted to take that one. The, the question was, can you search using different parameters? To... Um, if you wanted to search for a PO for a specific supplier, but you are not the one who submitted the requisition, how would you go about that? Oh, yeah, you could still use those parameters. So all you would do would be to put the supplier's name in those um, search bar parameters. And then just if you're looking for, I don't know if you're looking for a requisition or a PO, but um, either way, it should populate the the drop down box, uh, even if you is, didn't submit. This is Sandra. I'm just clarifying. So if I'm trying to look up a purchase order on Oracle, okay. I've mm -hmm. noticed on um, the search on the top right corner, it there's like a limit error that says search my orders or search like just through my personal orders. And I haven't been able to change that to see other purchase orders that aren't mine. So I know it's just a button that you need to mm -hmm. click, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't know what button you're supposed to click. Of course, um, I can hop in for a quick second. The best option for use is that manage requisition portion of the purchase requisition module. It's by far my favorite area. You can use that area to remove your name from the search area. And then the caveats that JB spoke of earlier, as long as you have your asterisks in place, you should be able to put in the supplier name and see other POs that don't belong to you. Thank you. Of course. All right. And then going to the next one, uh, which form is best used for event services like Bright Rentals? That is a great question. I'm going to, I think yeah. JV can answer this better than yeah, I can. I, I have to go back to those uh, request forms. There's like six or seven of them. Um, I would say the, you said for like example, like Bright, I would say the amount base. So it'd be number four on the slide. Uh, or not number four on the slide, number four on the request form. So it'll be the amount based 
services with fixed price. So it's used for services over a period of performance defined by the amount. So if it's something like events, you know, it will have a, a start and end date and maybe it's like a rental or something like that. That's usually how we would go through that process. So mm -hmm. amount-based services with fixed price. Yes. And that's when we brought out those caveats of the purchasing categories will matter greatly for a supplier like Bright Event Rentals. They are really good with providing their quotes and their quotes match up with, with how you su should submit the requisition in two parts, either a taxable or non-taxable one. So there will always be the distinction with that. And it helps them out with invoicing. It helps us out with submitting that requisition to PO and it will get your requisition to the PO in a faster stage. Okay, going to the next one is, if the quote includes shipping, should we add that to the PO or if we leave it out, will it still be paid similar to tax? As Vanessa, great question. Um, this is a huge part of the reason why POs do not get closed. You should not add a line for shipping on any PO. It goes against everything we've said in the past, but please don't do that. The supplier is able to add the shipping line to their invoice during AP submission. So before it gets to account payable, you can let the supplier know, please add a line for shipping. Um, it will not be on the PO, but AP will honor this. Because what happens is they, we create POs with the shipping line. AP cannot distinguish between that and they will not apply shipping to that line and your PO will stay open and it will not close. Then we'll have to reach out to IPPS via service and support case and we then have to close the PO for you. So great question, very similar to tax. <laughs> um, thank you. And then Gretchen had a question uh, about filling out the information when putting in a requisition. What is a supplier site? Mm -hmm. So another great question. The supplier site is basically the site where they are going to submit invoices from. It's their main location of services. We say this um, for those suppliers that are massive. I can't think of one off the top of my head, so I'm going to take a guess and say someone like Thermo Fisher. We know that's a massive organization in business right there. So they will have many supplier sites. Um, another good example is if you're working with another university, they, let's say, we'll give the example University of Michigan. They will have different supplier sites and the supplier sites can be linked with a department. So there is a way for you to go into the supplier name and then the next drop down that will have the supplier site you can use the drop down to find the magnifying glass and type in po and that will show you all the different sites available so this will help you for invoicing if you have the wrong supplier site it will be difficult for you to invoice with them so this is why it's important to have those pieces correct and if you do not see the supplier site that you need to work with, the specific department, DBA, part of the organization, um, parent company, or underneath the parent company, the child company, you can then have the supplier redo their payment compass in invitation and add a new supplier site. So if you don't see it, that's when then you can either reach out to us via service and support. We can walk you through how to get a new supplier site and that answers the question. It does. And then just to clarify, uh, will DBAs will also appear as different supplier sites? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Oracle limited us in our capabilities to review things. Um, I think that, that that's kind of one of those questions where it's a valid question. I do not believe you can see DBA sites. You will see either the supplier's name sometime but I think it's also one of those things where it's going to vary. You, you have to be a little bit more knowledgeable when you're using the system and what you're looking for, because I've had it where you can't find a supplier, but it's because they have a different name in the system. And there's no way you would have known that besides using Payment Compass or reaching out to us. So yeah, it's a little bit difficult, but DBA, they're hard to find. And then uh, when it comes to the conflict of interest, uh, if 
my spouse works, let's say for Amazon, and I'm purchasing paper towels from Amazon, is that considered conflict of interest or not? Uh, I am going to say a definite no. When we are working with conflict of interest suppliers, these are suppliers that own or have a financial interest of over 10% within the company. So the conflict of interest really comes into play when a active UC employee creates a consulting company and then tries to offer their services back to the university. So those are the key pain points that we're looking for. Places like Amazon or Fisher Thermo, where we can't be too concerned because the likelihood of them having a higher than 10% threshold is extremely unlikely. So there's no need to disclose those relationships. And then JB, another question about event services. Uh, for all of the attachments that we mentioned for avoiding delays, how do we know when, which of them are necessary for different event services? Um, well, depending on the event, if it's just usually like rentals or equipment or some type of service, all we would really need is just about an invoice or a quote of some sort, just to kind of let us know what is being done besides the description and the amount. So it can kind of justify everything based on the amount or the, the uh, document. Um, for events, I, yeah, I don't really need much else <clears throat> usually. Okay, perfect. And then um, kind of following up on that, do all contracts, including just simple audiovisual services, bartending and so on and so forth, do uh, all of them need to be signed by a greater campus or can the requesters sign any smaller contracts themselves? I don't think so, especially for catering. I don't even, we, as a services, we don't even offer that. We, we would have to handle that through Concur, I believe. So this is, this is an important question, right? No one should be signing any supplier papers if there are terms and conditions on that, on that document, right? That's step one. Step two is if you do not have delegation of authority from the chancellor, please do not sign. No. <laughs> Caveat two, right? So to answer your question, please ensure that you reach out to IPPS to get a signature or attend that upcoming Camp IPPS session with the buyers determining when you should sign. We have a buyer specifically from HDH and Catering that can help address those questions. Okay, perfect. And then to clarify, is there a professional buyer in IPPS assigned to each department on campus? I mean, at any time, always. Feel <laughs> I don't think so. Right, really? the answer is no. However, there are commodity buckets. So for the most part, if you yeah, have commodities. purchasing category, that is how you can determine which buyer should be available. I can say that there are certain departments that have enough funding that they were able to create their own commodity group, right? They're, they're large enough that they need that additional support. So these groups are our IT, SIO, HDH. So those are the three main commodity groups that have then been broken out so that we can give extra support there. But always feel free to reach out. I'm sure like we can navigate, negotiate, figure something out to get you some additional support for your department if it's large enough to warrant that. Awesome. And then when filling out a requisition, if there are, let's say, 20 plus items on the quote, um, can they just be entered in one requisition line or instead of entering 20 or more? Yes, they can, as long as it's for the same service. And it's not like um, any shipping or tax, stuff like that. There you go. So those are some important pieces, right? We want to make sure that if it's 20 plus lines on the quote, you're breaking out on taxability. That will be the easiest way. Um, it will also help you if the supplier is providing any discounts to then not have to stress yourself out. Also, we understand change orders happen. So if you need to make a change order, it will be easier to complete the change order on two lines versus 20 lines because Oracle does not play nice. Plus providing that invoice will also make it a lot easier for us to review it. And you know we don't have to check out those lines for you. 
-hmm. And then just going, uh, going back a little bit, John uh, was wondering if we can clarify when it comes to signatures, uh, when there are some intercampus recharge activities like room rentals, executive search recruitment, and the mm -hmm. department signature is requested, um, mm -hmm. are those agreements okay to sign without APPS or do they still need to go through the buyer? That's a great question. My first inclination is to say, yes, you should be able to sign intercampus agreements. Um, 